Hi, so I'm uh, here we're talking with Jamie Seltzer from uh, the Scientific Director at uh, ME Action. And we're just going to chat for a few minutes about uh, this week's NIH conference uh, gathering on uh, MECFS and uh, sort of how long COVID ties in. And so um, Jamie was there in person. I attended uh, not all the sessions, but some, most of them, probably half, two thirds of them uh, virtually. And so I just want to find out from Jamie, Jamie, what were your sort of takeaways and what were your kind of, you know, any highlights or impressions that you had? Well, first of all, it was great to be there and see so many familiar faces and put uh, some some faces to some names that I, I had uh, gotten to know online or in a virtual context. Um, I should point out the last one of these was at the NIH was four years ago. Uh, that's right. 19, which I attended in person at that time. And that was, you know, uh, there have been other gatherings, but they've all been virtual. So this was the first one of these. Um, uh, four years later, four and a half years later, um, that were people were, were able to attend in person. And um, there was a young investigators workshop or an early career investigators workshop associated with each of those. And so um, I spoke in 2019 and I spoke again this year um, about um, people with lived experience partnering in research, uh, some of the things we at ME Action had done um, and some advice about um, grant funding inside the NIH and outside of the NIH. Mm -hmm. And I'll say that one of the most encouraging aspects was that we had um, both many more early career investigators this time than in 2019, and that their work was extremely rigorous on average. They had great presentations themselves. They were doing very interesting work, many of them in association or affiliation with um, the mid-career and um, uh, later, I'm not sure what you call that, are uh, <laughs> our advanced yeah. researchers. Um, so they found good mentors and they were doing excellent rigorous work with those mentors. That's very encouraging. Um, I know that one of the concerns in 2019 was that we were going to have um, many researchers retire and not really be left with a lot of people in the field. And I'm less concerned about that now than I was in 2019. Wait, so 2018 was which meeting specifically? Because the other, the, the previous NIH gathering like this was 2019, I thought. Yeah, I, I said that. You might have misheard me. 2019. Or mm -hmm. I might have misspoken. It has been a long couple of days. But yes, okay. I meant 2019. Okay. Um, and so it's possible I misheard as well because my hearing is not perfect. Um, the... Um, so that sounds like a good a, a good sign going forward. What about the presentations uh, in terms of the main presentations? Was there anything in particular that struck your interest or that you found to be encouraging or, you know, whatever? I would say that some of the most encouraging presentations were those that were clearly from a group of researchers working together to produce multiple results because you could see that, uh, you know, these these people had however many people working under them in their lab and that they were each doing these experiments that relate to each other. Um, so Daria, uh, I'm, I'm unsure how to pronounce the last name, Unamats. Mm -hmm. yes, <laughs> um, his lab's work and Elaine Moreau's work, I found to be the most impressive for that reason. There are a lot of um, interlocking studies that are going to, where the results depend on each other. And I think that that's the kind of work that we need in order to uh, produce meaningful progress. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that struck me is that there seem to be, I mean, as we, we've known, there seem to be things going on in so many different areas. Um, and I think Tony uh, Komarov spoke to that when he, in his closing, when he said it used to be that people were told, oh, there's not, you know, oh, there's nothing wrong with you. And now the, the response is, well, how can all these things be going wrong with these people? So that yes. there's, you know, and he says, well, they can all be going wrong with people because they're sort of a self, -re if, if you hypothesize them or uh, theorize them as a, a sort of self-reinforcing structure, all these different systems that you could enter the area, the the kind of cycle through one and get caught up in this, in this uh, uh, kind of cycle. What was your thought about that? Well, two thoughts on that. First of all, uh, Komarov was nothing less than heroic for trying to summarize every single talk during the conference <laughs> yeah, well, and presentation. Right. That was really impressive. Um, but uh, but second of all, um, I have I have a thought about 
this disease being as somehow like the most complicated disease on the planet. I really don't think that that's true. Mm -hmm. I think we don't know a lot about it. We're coming at it from a bunch of different angles. Um, I think that a, a, a lot of neurological diseases or diseases classified as neurological, we'll say, um, have symptoms in every body system. Um, and I would say that that's true for a lot of diseases that are classified as metabolic. Uh, diabetes can have symptoms in, in many different body systems and be very complex. It's just that because we already under, understand the etiology of type 2 diabetes, um, we tend to focus on things that we know are um, sort of easy to link to the central hypothesis of what's causing diabetes. We don't know that in ME, and then therefore we find all of these uh, signs, signals, symptoms, um, biological abnormalities in different systems. Um, so I actually don't think that the symptom presentation is as unusual as mm -hmm. it is often um, presented. I think it's much like other neurological illness, much like other metabolic disease, but since we don't know where it comes from, our focus is a little scattered, so we're observing many, many things. When, when if there's a, a a sort of causal kind of a, a core causal thing that the other aspects might ultimately orient themselves around that and arising out of that in some sort of way. Absolutely, and then you know I'm sure in uh, ongoing there would be smaller studies based off of like MECFS's aspects uh, on um, vision or aspects on, um, you know, skin or uh, elasticity or keratin, but those will be, you know, smaller studies probably in the future that will sort of uh, inform that core picture. Right now, we don't know what the core is, so we're doing all of, all of these little um, studies in different arenas, and we don't know which one is gonna be that prima mobile, that, that first domino um, that will, indicate what's causing this. So what, in terms of what was your thought about the discussions about the parallels and differences between uh, long COVID and sort of MECFS, if one is going to characterize them as separate uh, conditions? I mean, that's obviously been a contentious issue uh, mm. in terms of the naming and the nomenclature and do people, you know, get an MECFS or an ME diagnosis or don't they and so on. But you know, there there were there were some presentations which were discussing um, sort of again similarities and as well as some differences uh, between groups. I would say that I view that from more of a clinical perspective than a research perspective. Honestly, um, long COVID refers to any diseases, disorders, ongoing issues after COVID, and that's more than MECFS. Um, but an MECFS type. So let me let me just clarify. I totally. Sure. It's very important to make that point that long COVID is sort of a a term that is used, but it's very non. It's very generic, and it basically means anybody experiencing any symptoms, which may or may not be. But there is a. So let let me sort of then clarify my question, which is the comparisons being made generally were about the people with long COVID that sort of has. How many of an the MECFS like picture? MECFS like yes, picture, the same the similar cluster of non-specific symptoms with in many cases uh, nose and taste issues added in, which are not apparent in MECFS, um, but with with a similar cluster of symptoms. So talking about comparing that group with the group that we have diagnosed as MECFS, as opposed to you know long COVID sort of as a large thing stipulating uh -huh. that long COVID includes many, many other people. And, you know, it, it, and, and we have definitional category, uh, definitional issues with what is long COVID in terms of everybody working off different definitions. So given all that, we have- Given to all that, um, I would say that um, this, this is why I started off by saying I view this from a more clinical lens. So I think that if you meet the diagnostic criteria for MECFS and COVID was your um, trigger, then you should have the label of MECFS because that means that you can have access to the right treatments and doctors. People who are looking at long COVID are not necessarily um, 
I mean, you're still high, highly liable to be prescribed talk therapy and exercise um, if you go to the wrong long COVID clinic. Um, and at least in the U.S., there are some places that you can go with the MECFS diagnosis that are um, that are going to have something to give you. They're they're going to have suggestions and a protocol. Um, I would also say that um, while there are a lot of different viewpoints, and while there is no real solid proof one way or the other, it certainly does appear that. MECFS can be kicked off by any, I, I usually say, immunological stressor of sufficient heft, because there's not really a technical term for this. Um, so that means that we could have had MECFS precipitated by EBV, by enterovirus, um, by the flu in some cases, in some people, um, and, and by COVID. Um, and in, in those cases, we have some symptoms that develop that are unique to the effects of the pathogen. For instance, um, liver failure sometimes occurs in EBV. It's more common. Um, and reactivation of the virus is often part of EBV-triggered MECFS. And it's not necessarily the case for, for other triggering pathogens. So you have these unique elements, but then you have a core that I would call MECFS. And that includes PEM and the cognitive dysfunction, dysautonomia, um, the uh, muscular aspects. And I would also say, uh, I, I find it odd that this is not automatically the prevailing view because it's the same way in, it may be the same way in every neurological disease that it gets, uh, you have these genetic predisposing factors and then you have epigenetic changes with the viral trigger. This is true in Guillain-Barre. This is true in apparently Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis. Um, it may very well be true of neurological disease broadly overall. Yeah, I, um, think, I mean, I do think that there's some rationale for at least keeping some categories distinct, even if you give people multiple categories, because I think oh, yes. to say, okay, MECFS, but MECFS clearly arising from a, a, COVID, a coronavirus infection as opposed to MECFS clearly arising from something else. I mean, Maureen Hansen was suggesting that it's all enterovirus. Yeah. And these uh, are, are sort of assisting viruses that maybe weaken the immune system in some way and make a asymptomatic, perhaps, enterovirus infection um, allow it to sort of transform, you know, trigger MECFS. So, I mean, I think, it, it, you know, from that perspective, I don't know how what what your thought about that the enterovirus uh, as the core uh, potential pathogen with the other ones kind of satellite ones around it. I'd say that there's definitely a role for ongoing infection, co-infections, and reactivating infections in the etiology and presentation of MECFS and long COVID. Long COVID. Um, folks have been shown to have a lot of reactivated, again, EBV. Um, there was a study that showed that. And other herpes um, so, viruses as well. Yeah, other herpes viruses too. Um, so I think that that's almost certainly part of it. Um, I, I would say it might be too early to say that it is certainly that, but um, I haven't had a conversation with Maureen Hansen about this, so I don't know like all of her rationales for believing that so strongly. Um, but I th think, um, you know, what I said about this being kind of a classical neurological disease caused in by classical uh, triggers is is my point of view, and I certainly couldn't defend it in a court of law. Um, so I, I fully recognize um, that other hypotheses do have merit. And, and honestly, I think um, a problem we've had in this field in the past is that people have gotten married to their hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when you become close to other points of view and you, um, you stop taking in information that disagrees with your pet hypothesis. And that can stymie a field. You, you really have to keep an open mind and say, you know, everything that has some decent evidence should be considered until we're sure. So were there any findings that particularly struck you as, um, you know, 
uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, I mean, it was more kind of, I guess, overall a summing up of, of things that have been coming out. So it's not like there was anything groundbreaking new presented. Um, but anyway, just was wondering if there was anything that you came away with thinking, oh, I didn't know that before, or oh, that really might be a thing, or oh, hmm, uh, wow, kind of cool. So um, I I thought a lot of the young investigators work was was pretty cool and innovative. Um, I also like Michelle James's work on the full body PET scans. I thought that was interesting because nobody's done it before. Um, but even even in the case of that study, I had spoken to her about the study in the past. Um, a lot of there was one that I missed at the end because I was traveling to see a friend in in Philadelphia. Um, can you tell me what that what 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 that was about briefly? That was the yes. thing, second day. Yeah. So normally um, you do a PET scan of, of the brain, um, typically, right? Um, and and let me preface this by saying I'm far from from an expert in um, that, that kind of technology. Yeah. Um, but she decided to scan um, the entire uh, body, which is not normally done. Um, of people with MECFS, um, and, uh, and and she was mostly looking at um, moderate severe, I would say, patients, um, and she found signs of diffuse inflammation throughout the body. Um, and uh, and I I am in an interview, but I would say don't quote me on this. It's always better to look at the original study. Um, but I thought that that was interesting. I think it's interesting because it is, you know, direct proof that there's a, a diffuse everywhere in the body kind of process happening. Um, that, and that is that kind of thing is something that um, patients are are always looking for. You know, here's evidence that something has gone definitively wrong, um, and it's very hard to argue with a PET scan. Um, so I I did think that that was that was interesting, um, but the the field is small still, and so um, a lot of a lot of these folks have presented um, the foundation for what they presented today in the past, and so what we heard was kind of like the next step in the process for them, and mm -hmm. in some cases I had heard um, more or less the same presentation before. Um, so uh, it's hard to say that a lot of it was surprising, but it was it was good progress. I think what, one thing that I found, and then I think we can wrap up, but that that I I like that uh, uh, Kamara said at the end as well was that um, we keep hearing that you know people keep saying, well, there's been so many studies, but nothing's ever replicated, and so on and so forth. And he says we have a lot of biological findings that have been replicated over and over. That yeah. is just not at this point, uh, you know, warranted. Yeah, I think that um, there are major issues with replication. Um, the first is that you're unlikely to get funded to replicate somebody else's work. Right. Um, R21s and, and some other grants um, particularly emphasize that your work has to be new or innovative in some way. So that's challenging. Um, and... Uh, the other thing is that somebody will get privately funded for like a little seed grant to 50K, 100K. They'll find something in 10 patients. They'll apply for a larger grant and they'll get turned down. Um, we have very little funding in this disease. Um, it, just in case your, your viewers, readers have not heard this before, research funding would have to increase by, I believe it's 27 times, certainly more than 25 times in order to be commensurate with disease burden. Um, and- I mean, those are very important points to make, but having yeah. said, it's still, I mean, it's still not really a, the case that nothing's been replicated and we have- Oh, no, 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 absolutely that, not. That, um, yeah, so, so that was sort of the, the, the overall context, but yes, of sure. course. Um, <clears throat> I think also there was one slide, I mean, I think the, the in recent years, I mean, it was it was five million for many many years, and then it was thirteen million <clears throat> issues more more recently from NIH <clears throat> yeah. going to it. So it's better, but it's still quite small compared to 
other illnesses, as you say. Okay, um, Jamie, thank you. I think we've been talking for about our 20 minutes that I try to allot, or maybe a little more. And I'm going to um, turn off the recording now. And uh, if I can find it. Oh, here it is.